Uh, what's up, Doc? My name is Eric Bowser. I'm the voice of Bugs Bunny, Tweety Bird, and Daffy Duck. On Bugs Bunny Builders. From what I read, you grew up in a neighborhood called Scarsboro, correct? Uh, Scarborough, Ontario, Canada. That is correct. It is a yeah. suburb of Toronto, uh, home to uh, Mike Myers, uh, Jim Carrey, uh, John Candy. A lot of famous Canadian comedians came out of that city. And um, I read in a complex interview, actually, that it was a very racially diverse neighborhood. You were exposed to a lot of perspectives and kinds of people. That Correct. Uh, Toronto itself, much like New York City, is a very diverse city, uh, very multicultural. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, it, we, we embrace that. Uh, and, you know, it's it's one of those things that uh, growing up, I'll, I'll never forget as far as like my wide variety of friends, people from all over the world. Building up on that, um, I was curious to see how was growing up in such a culturally diverse area and being exposed to so many different kinds of people, how did that influence your career, especially as someone who is essentially paid to, you know, um, assume the roles and assume the characters of such a diverse range of characters? Well, it's just, uh, again, embracing everyone's differences. And when you're voicing uh, the Looney Tunes, even just within the Looney Tunes, not, I mean, not just uh, uh, acting in general, but like there's so many different personalities, so many different dialects, so many different uh, pitches and sounds that you hear from a Looney Tunes cartoon that I would often hear like from friends. And I'm, uh, you know, Filipino in descent. Uh, and my parents mm -hmm. uh, immigrated from the Philippines. So right away, I was in a household where my parents had accents that were different from even mine because uh, I was born in Toronto. Right. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, like even even just that alone uh, was enough inspiration to kind of, you know, almost mimic the, the Filipino Pinoy accent, you know, like it's it's just yeah. my household. And uh it's funny because sometimes I'll, I, you know, oftentimes I would do it and it would just make people laugh or, or uh, you know, my parents would laugh, my, my cousins, my aunts and uncles. And that's just more fuel for me. Don't laugh at me. If you don't encourage him, they always say, uh, you know, if, yeah. if, I, if I start, then if I hear people laughing, I'm just going to keep going. Now I sort of want to talk about, you know, going into your career, right? So everyone loves talking about big breaks and successes, but what I'm most curious about is, is what are some of the biggest obstacles that you face trying to break into this um, a voice acting industry, which is actually predominantly dominated by white males. If you think about people like like um, Seth MacFarlane from Family Guy or even uh, Mel Blanc, who was the original voice for Bugs Bunny. Uh, well, you know, it's funny because in my mind and, and when you think about it, it's voiceover, right? right. So uh, right. this, you know, what I look like doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily, it shouldn't matter, right? Because it's all about how you sound and how you act. I think the biggest mm -hmm. obstacle for me was like making sure the performance was believable. Like, and that is like the number one question that I always uh, the, the number one answer I always uh, uh, answer to people who ask, like, how do you get into voiceover? What's the most important thing? It's 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 not about the funny voice. It's about the acting, really. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, anyone can do it as long as you're a, a, a good actor and performer, even if when it comes to cartoon, even when it comes to cartoon rabbits, William, you mm -hmm. have to feel for that character. You have to when the stakes are high, you have to cheer that character on. And that only comes from a good, believable performance. Now, nowadays, cultural representation in animation, even behind the microphone, is very important. Authentic casting yeah. is very important. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, uh, there are a lot of uh, doors now being opened uh, to folks of, uh, you know, uh, diverse backgrounds that might not have had the chance to read for those characters, but now we want to hear that authentic voice coming from a character, uh, you know, that, that is diverse. And that was also another talking point that I actually had for one of my later questions. I was very curious to see that because, as you said before, uh, voice acting is mostly about um, the voice itself and not the face behind the voice. And going off of that, why do you think 
is representation important in um, a sort of like um, a field where the voice is what counts and it doesn't really matter what they look like? It's it all comes down to the storytelling, like authentic storytelling. Like it's it, it goes beyond the voice. Now, it should also extend to who's writing the story. You know, yeah. like if, if you're going to say, yeah, this is a movie about the Filipino, you know, growing up in Canada you know, there's no better person to write that story than a Filipino who grew up in Canada. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, it's very specific now. And right. I feel like, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. Change it up. You know, tell us some different stories. Tell us some stories from that storyteller that kind of speak to an audience that'll, it'll still resonate with a general audience, but you know, we're looking for new stories. We're looking for more diverse stories and more interesting stories. We're, you know, kind of sick of seeing the same thing over and over again. It's it's nice to change things up. And, 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 I, I, and you know, it goes for even superheroes where, where, like, they recast someone and it's a different culture. And it's like, yeah, oh, why yeah. not? You know, like, we've, we've seen, you know, the white Superman before. You know, why not change exactly. it up? You know, make it different. It could be an alternate universe. Now we're dealing with multiverse uh, right. scenarios, mm -hmm. and I think yeah. it's an interesting uh, time, uh, even in entertainment. You know, with what's happening politically and and socially in the world, and I, I love that in entertainment. It's it's always championed. You know, like yeah, it's always. Uh, you know, diverse and even like, you know, it, 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 when when the news came out that I was the new voice of Bugs Bunny for Looney Tunes cartoons and, and now Bugs Bunny Builders, you know, it, I didn't think of it as such a big deal. But then I guess if if a kid that shares our face, mm -hmm. you know, maybe might not have the courage to use his voice or speak up or her voice, right? If I could be that beacon or inspiration for a, a, a young performer. Uh, to have that courage and say, hey, look, he, he, he's doing something that, like voicing an iconic character, maybe that's something I can do. Or even if you don't share this face, if you have a different face than this, or, right. or just sh shy to use your own voice, uh, or, or you feel different, if, if I'm uh, an inspiration to people, then, then I'm all for it, for sure. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm I'm that I'm a massive comics nerd too. And I just thought that it was really, really interesting how when I was looking through your film credits, you actually voiced a character named Amadeus Cho. And not many people might know this, but he's actually um an Asian iteration of the Hulk, which I thought was totally bonkers. I mean, he's literally totally awesome Hulk. That's what his name is, you know. But I just thought that was really neat, you know, especially with the rise of like different multiverses. That's where we had Miles Morales, the black Spider-Man, you know. And I just think it's really cool how now we're definitely getting a lot of more diverse stories that are really coming through, you know? Like uh, Amadeus Cho, is he's known as the seventh smartest man right. in the Marvel mm -hmm. Universe. <laughs> I like how yeah. he's number, number seven. Uh, right. <laughs> There's six other people, you know, like, uh, I think Reed Richards is probably like, was he four or one? I'm not sure. But I he's... think he's number one, but Amadeus right, right. is number seven mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, cool stuff. And um, now I sort of want to get into um, your sort of craft, right? How do you go about creating these diverse characters? Where do you draw inspiration from? Do you study past interpretations of the characters? Do you study the people around you in your life to create a unique spin on these characters? How do you go about sort of, you know, crafting these voices well, in a way that's unique and authentic, you know? Again, I'm super lucky to be uh, blessed with the opportunity to voice characters like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and, and Tweety because, you know, we're, we've we've celebrated Bugs' 80th birthday two years ago. We're celebrating Tweety's 80th birthday this year. These characters are old enough to, to call them grandma and grandpa, you know, like they're like old yeah. relatives to us. We know them like old relatives. And... Uh, my education in animation started with Looney Tunes, like the 1940s cartoons, not just for the voices, but for the art. Uh, before I was a voiceover artist, I was a, a cartoonist. And uh, I used to love recording these cartoons, the classics, and pausing it and drawing from my screen, like yeah. poses. And I would learn how to draw Bugs Bunny that way and Daffy. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I, all the all the hard work was done by people like Chuck Jones and Bob Clampett and of course Mel Blanc who created the voices. I'm just uh I'm just a caretaker that is uh I'm actually I think I'm number 6. I might be number 7. I'm not sure. I think I might be number 6 for Bugs. And I know there's going to be more after me. 
So I'm just looking to Mel for all of the... All of those tones that uh, every time I say, uh, you know, what's up, Jack? And you smile, I know I'm doing a good job. Right, yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. I mean, like, you have to be doing a good job if you're going to be able to bag such a, you know, big role, you know? Yeah, and again, uh, aside from Mel, there, there are people that uh, voiced Bugs after Mel that is part of the 80 years. So you look at people like Bob Bergen, Jeff Bergman, uh, Billy West... The late mm -hmm. great Joe Lasky, the late great uh, Greg Burson. These are all people that voice Bugs and, and others. And uh, they kept those characters long uh, alive and well long enough for me. Uh, uh, kept them around long enough for me to join the table. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm grateful to those guys too and girls. One, one thing that I'm also very curious about is because you're next up in line. So all these students, they're going to be studying you. You know, you're like the next part of that legacy are there any sort of changes that you've made to these classic voices that sort of give them a unique bowza spin to them well i think when you're an impressionist it, there there is such a thing as being too precise and too careful that you kind of put yourself in this box and mm -hmm. when you look back at mel blank's performance with uh, uh, something like a character like bugs bunny there are so many moments and times where he would go he would go out of the character voice and do like this crazy manic man scream, which is like, uh, you know, he would be like uh, all fine and dandy like this, but then he'd go, "Ooh, I'm dying!" You know, like <laughs> that stuff where it's like it's just his kind of natural DNA voice. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're an impressionist, it's hard to kind of do those kinds of moments that were so specific to Mel. And that's the one thing that I always wanted to try to do is like those out of the box moments with bugs mm. that I feel like really round out that character. And uh, I remember when the first trailer dropped for uh, Looney Tunes cartoons and one of those moments was in the preview. And I was like, oh my God, this is the moment where, you know, the fans will either rake you over the coals or like go, hey, good job. And a lot of the uh, nine times out of ten, I I would see the fan reaction of, "Wow, he he did the scream!" <laughs> like they like they <laughs> yeah. they, rec they recognize what I was trying to do, and I was like, "Okay, whew, okay, I did it. Okay, we're we're good." And then um, from there on in, yeah, you definitely have to try to make it your own in the sense that you're reading scripts that no one's ever read. Mel Blanc has mm -hmm. never read them. The fans have never heard them. Right. So you're trying to. Um, you know, use the same musicality of the character, but then I'll take from real life experiences in the acting, you know, when what kind of experiences in real life did you put into some of your performances? I'm curious. Oh, just, just yeah. everything, happiness, sadness, anger, you know, like, cause again, these characters go through a range of emotions, even in, and especially preschool, you right. know, like they, they want to show the entire, uh, you know, uh, a rainbow of emotions that you could have as a kid and when you're angry it's okay to be angry just let it all out and mm -hmm. uh everything will be fine you, you'll 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 definitely uh, uh fix it uh especially with the bugs bunny builders there's always there's always fixing to be done it's hard hat time yeah uh, uh to uh you know doing a job well done and and celebrating with your friends they like they 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 go through a lot in the show and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've seen the screeners too. That was also something that I really wanted you to talk about because, like, yeah. I thought it was actually very entertaining. I, I thought that, you know, um, at first it was pitched as a preschool show, and I was like, oh, it might be a little bit dumbed down. But, like, a lot of the scenarios are really entertaining. Like, the first one, it's like Foghorn Leghorn and the water slide. And it's like these real life situations where it's like Bugs Bunny is taking up too much responsibility and he's overstepping his boundaries. And then he, he gets overwhelmed, you know, because he's playing the yes man. That's literally something that has been told to me as a college student, you know? And I think it's just so cool how you're teaching all of these truly valuable and profound lessons to like preschoolers, you know? Yeah. Well, hey, it's uh, for me. It's I, I give kudos to the writers on, on the team. They they come up with so many great stories and scenarios every week, and uh, you know, I, I read uh, uh, Tweety, Daffy, and Bugs. So I read the script three times <laughs> in a session, and it's like it's amazing how it all it all plays out and and. Uh, you know, it's it's because of the genius of the writers on this show that we get to keep having more adventures with these characters. 
Right. And I also wanted you to talk about um, the broader significance of this Looney Tunes Bugs Builders show. Um, like, what is its significance in the context of both your careers in terms of your interpretation of Bugs Bunny? Because I know for a fact that you definitely made a little bit cha of changes, and I want to sort of hear you talk about that. So in the context of your interpretation, but also in the context of the broader Looney Tunes canon, you know? So well, if you I, talk about those two aspects. I, I think, again, like, you know, we... <laughs> That we used to have only like a remake or a reboot once in a, a blue moon, uh, and now and nowadays with all the streaming channels and all the the different variations and and programming changes in programming, like Cartoon Network now has a preschool block, which I think is amazing because they did well on the Adult Swim side. You know, they they went from like being just a cartoon station and then having like content for adults. But they kind of forgot about the kids. Right. And I feel like with Cartoonito, that's a great opportunity to, uh, you know, attract, like, obviously one of the best audiences out there. I have a six-year-old son, and we love watching things over and over again. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's the ultimate, uh, <laughs> it's the ultimate babysitter for him and me, uh, watching cartoons over and over again. And, you know, there there isn't really a representation of Looney Tunes for the preschool audience. And I think that mm -hmm. is a great way. If you think that the classic cartoons are a bit too much for a preschooler, you know, the, the questions of cartoon uh, slapstick um, versus like, here's an educational show with the same characters, with the same integrity and humor of the characters from mm -hmm. those 40s classics, yeah, but with a different way of storytelling for today's preschool audience, I think it's like perfect. And Right. Mm -hmm. would love to add to that and, and expand that for these characters. And yeah, as far as change-ups uh, in acting, it's just being a little bit more clear and uh, uh, speaking a little bit slower uh, so the kids can hear it at home for clarity. But at the same time, you know, you're you're laughing when you watch this show. You're not, yeah. you're, not mm -hmm. you're not waiting till the next one's over. You're kind of like along for the ride with these characters. And uh yeah, every time I see previews or new clips uh, that come out for this show, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so much fun. It is so much fun, right? Like, I feel like it's really amazing how you're able to, like, you know, sort of change the demographic, but it still does retain a lot of that sort of energetic, vibrant, off-the-wall sort of humor that Looney Tunes is known for, which I thought is really, really awesome, and I really, really appreciate what you're doing in terms of this new spin for the whole Looney Tunes canon. But anyways, I think that's our last question. I mean, I would love to spend hours upon hours talking about all your different roles, but you know, um, that's all, that's pretty much all the time that I have for today, but thank you so much for spending time with me, you know? Well, hopefully we can have a part two or something. Uh, I'm course, always around yeah. if you ever want to chat. Uh, of course. I mean, there's I, always going to be Looney Tunes content, you know, so yeah. definitely keep Next Shark in mind the next time, you know, something comes out. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you taking the time talking with us today, Doc. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope you catch uh, Bugs Bunny Builders July 25th. Mm -hmm. Of course I will. Of course I will. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's all, folks.